you very much, Steve, uh, and, and welcome everybody. I'm really excited to be here with you today. Um, we are uh, thrilled to be able to present to you today some of the insights that we've learned um, from our work uh, during COVID-19 um, that has led us to explore uh, new tools and resources uh, to support and address the pandemic and support decision makers in particular, as well as the research synthesis community. Um, we've been doing some work, as many people have done, we've pivoted uh, our activities quite a bit and are now dedicating quite a bit of time and resource to uh, supporting the pandemic response, um, both provincially, uh, nationally and internationally. And uh, we thought it was an opportune time as grants get underway and um, work gets slightly more organized in this next phase of the pandemic uh, to share with you some of these early insights. Uh, uh, about how to prepare evidence syntheses uh, to support COVID responses. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to take us through a little bit of background and then uh, start with uh, some of the insights. Great. Thanks very much, Heather. Um, so just a, a couple of slides about COVID end. COVID end is a time-limited network that has come together in response to COVID-19, which uh, many of us think of as, as both a shock um, uh, on the evidence demand side, so uh, a significant interest on the part of decision makers in being able to find best evidence to inform their decision making, but also a shock on the evidence supply side. And covid -end is specifically not working it across the entire evidence ecosystem. So, for example, not way upstream on some of the primary biomedical research or laboratory research, um, and also not way out on the implementation side, but more the evidence synthesis, health technology assessment, and guidelines space. And we're trying to uh, work in partnership with a large group of partners around the globe, and I'll show you their logos in a minute, to make the most of this explosion of interest in and demand for evidence synthesis. And one of the things that we're trying to do is reduce the noise to signal ratio. Um, so on a, a seemingly straightforward question like masks, uh, very early in the pandemic, when we went to do a rapid evidence profile for government, uh, we found 33 evidence syntheses that had been completed just in the preceding week. Um, secondly, we're trying to make the evidence ecosystem even more robust and resilient in future so that as we enter um, different waves of the pandemic and pandemic response, but also for future um, challenges that we might face, uh, we are better prepared with a robust evidence ecosystem. And finally, we're trying to strengthen existing institutions and processes. So there are a number of, of key players in the evidence synthesis ecosystem, Cochrane, for example, Evidence Aid, many others. Uh, and our goal through this work is to strengthen both them and their processes so they're in even greater positions to achieve impacts uh, in the medium and longer term. So we are now uh, just shy of 50 members uh, from around the globe who are part of the COVID-19 Evidence Network to support decision making. Uh, you'll see about two thirds of their logos uh, on this slide, um, and they cover the full spectrum from high income countries to low middle income countries from those focused more on public health and clinical management to those focused more on health system arrangements and the economic and social response. Uh, COVID uh, right at the beginning of its work, developed seven principles that would underpin its work. And it's probably important uh, for this webinar to highlight three of them. So one is the goal of supporting, not competing with or replacing well-positioned organizations that are already working in close partnership with key target audiences and already responding to their evidence needs. And chances are uh, a number of individuals on the call are part of those organizations. And this webinar, we hope, is a way uh, to help you get even farther, faster uh, in your uniquely well-positioned uh, domain to have an impact. Second, we're trying to support with a common brand and identity, a small agile secretariat, and uh, seven working groups, a distributed network of organizations and individuals. And we're, what we're really trying to support is each of them playing to their comparative advantages and each leveraging one another's work. And the third 
third principle is seeking a quick wins uh, for those supporting decision makers and those involved in preparing evidence syntheses and other evidence products, but also taking steps to longer term solutions. And you'll be seeing a number of the quick wins uh, as we move through the slides. So this is an overview of our, our 10 insights. Um, I'm going to walk you through insights 1 to 8, and then Mike is going to elaborate in particular um, on insight number 5 and walk you through some practical steps in, involved in a particular evidence support model. And then we're going to turn it over to Heather uh, to talk about plans for horizon scanning, but also to speak to some of the uh, particular issues that might come up when you're doing these types of ev uh, evidence syntheses in the mental health and addiction space. Um, and Heather can speak a bit more about uh, that focus when we come to it. The reason for some of the variation in the colors, um, insights two through six are all insights for those working very directly with decision makers to support them uh, as they're confronted with difficult issues related to the pandemic. Um, the other two in red at the bottom are just to flag that I'll, we'll be transitioning to different speakers for those two. Um, and the one in bold is bolded because we have just uh, put up on the website um, a set of resources to support researchers considering or conducting an evidence synthesis. So uh, some of you might have um, been made aware of this webinar because you were the successful recipient of a grant from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research in the mental health and addiction space. Um, and many of you will be conducting rapid systematic reviews. So this list of resources might be particularly helpful to you. We still have some changes we're going to be making on that part of the website, but, but we do have a working prototype up for this newly revamped set of resources. So on to Insight 1. So Insight 1 is uh, we have a website that is specifically designed to meet the needs of two target audiences. And if you're on this webinar, chances are you fall into one of the two. And you might fall into both. So those supporting decision makers, so Mike, uh, when we come to Insight 9, uh, is an example of someone running an evidence shop trying to directly support governments to make informed decisions about COVID-19. There are other people who are doing more traditional systematic reviews or rapid systematic reviews, and that connection to decision making and the demand side might not be as direct. Uh, and one of the things that we've observed through COVID end is the remarkable number of new entrants into the evidence synthesis space. People who are um, motivated to try to make a difference with COVID-19, but they might not be aware of all of the resources available to help people produce evidence syntheses in a way that is both robust and well-primed to make an impact. So I'd encourage you to think about checking out the website. If you can see in the lower right corner where we have a screen capture of the website, across the dark gray bar, the headlines are overview, resources to support decision makers, resources for researchers and the working groups, and then you'll see the seven working groups listed across the bottom. Uh, most of what I'm going to be talking about are in that second dark gray cell, uh, resources uh, for supporting decision makers, uh, and one of the insights is going to be about that new suite of resources for researchers. Insight number two is our guide to key COVID-19 evidence sources. So um, when we first began providing um, rapid evidence profiles for government, uh, we had a hard time uh, getting a handle on all the different places uh, that um, were starting to emerge that were putting together different types of research evidence on which we needed to draw in order to do our work. We have a very, very long, almost exhaustive list of these evidence sources, but we regularly call that list down to the high yield, high quality sources that are absolutely essential for groups like us, uh, groups like the one led by Mike, who have to respond sometimes in as little as three hours to a request request from decision makers. The guide is organized by first guidelines, so living guidelines, and then more generally recommendations developed using a robust approach. 
then on to living systematic reviews. And in the last couple of weeks, uh, we are uh, gratefully seeing more and more people transition from rapid reviews to beginning to lay the groundwork for living systematic reviews that are regularly updated, given how fast the science is moving on many of the questions that need answering. We then move on to full systematic reviews, as well as sources of evidence profiles. So the evidence profiles are tables summarizing, for example, the impacts of an intervention on key outcomes. So it's a way at, of keeping abreast again of a fast moving area by quickly seeing what the state of the evidence is. Then there are all of the rapid reviews, which we organize by global groups, by national groups, and then uh, rapid reviews that are addressing a particular topic. Then we move on to protocols. So you may not find a review of some type on a question that you're grappling with, uh, but you might find that someone has registered a protocol. Um, so you could reach out to them and say, All right, will you be done within a few days, within a week, in which case you can then build on that product that is about to appear. We also track titles or questions that have been already uh, flagged as ones that people are planning. And then finally, sources of single studies that are focused on COVID-19. We are finding for our own rapid evidence profile service that Mike runs, that we are often being asked both about the evidence but also about what other jurisdictions are doing. So it could be another province or territory, it could be another country. At the bottom of our guide, you'll find the government response trackers that we find most helpful when we're quickly trying to come to grips with how other uh, countries have responded to a particular challenge. We try never to do jurisdictional scans without an evidence synthesis because we think knowing what people are doing can help, but it's not as helpful as knowing what the evidence is about whether what they're doing is actually making a difference. Insight number three is about a four-part taxonomy that we've created as part of COVID and um, and we've tried to come up with a mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive list of, of all of the decisions related to the pandemic and the pandemic response. Um, so this will not include upstream questions um, like candidates for vaccines, for example. Um, it's focused on the types of decisions that decision makers are now confronting or are likely to confront in future, but not that upstream uh, flow of, of research that isn't yet ready for prime time. We've segmented the taxonomy into public health measures, and that includes infection prevention and control, but also broader public health measures, clinical management, both of COVID-19, but also pandemic-related health issues like unmanaged chronic conditions, uh, something relevant to many of you on the webinar, mental health and addiction issues, family violence, for example. The third part of the taxonomy are about health system arrangements. So how do we organize and periodically adjust our health system arrangements in order to uh, attend to particular challenges emerging related to COVID-19? Uh, and you'll see some examples in brackets. And then finally, economic and social responses. So what is being done across a range of non-health sectors uh, to respond to the pandemic, but also the pandemic's many uh, impacts on citizens. So we'd encourage you to take a look at the taxonomy. We think it serves four purposes. And the first one we're actively focused on right now, uh, beginning to curate existing evidence products using the taxonomy. Second, we think the taxonomy can inform the prioritization of questions that need to be answered as issues emerge. So uh, Cochrane, for example, is using the taxonomy as part of its priority setting process. Third, we hope it can inform the prioritization of evidence documents that should be kept up to date for the foreseeable future. So those are those living reviews or living guidelines I talked about. And finally, it can inform the prioritization of evidence products that we'll likely need in future phases of either the pandemic or the pandemic response. Insight four, and this is a new addition to the website as of a day or two ago, um, we've developed through one of our working groups um, a set of five principles for evidence packaging. So if you are one of those groups 
that are being called upon to package existing evidence for decision makers, those principles may be helpful to you. But we've also developed and will be continuously um, updating an inventory of evidence packaging resources. And those are grouped into six different approaches. So resources to help communicate in plain language, resources to help translate content into multiple languages, resources to help meet the needs of groups with distinct information needs. We're finding that um, in these early months of the pandemic that the two dominant target audiences are policymakers and providers um, and citizens are typically receiving their advice directly from governments or government agencies um, and less frequently going directly to the science underpinning those. Um, the fourth domain is about how to group content thematically for those with shared interests. Fifth, how to combat misinformation. And sixth, um, provide a daily fix about what we do know and don't know. So we both describe the approaches briefly, but we also point to exemplars of where people are doing this focused on COVID-19 in a way that we find very compelling. If we now move on to evidence support models, so this is the piece that Mike is going to pick up in more detail. I just have two brief slides about it. So um, at the forum, we've developed a model for a rapid evidence profile that we think can be used or adapted in any jurisdiction. Um, and it allows you to summarize in as little as three hours both what the evidence says, but as I alluded to before, based on jurisdictional scans, innovations that may be uh, trying that, that different countries may be trying. Um, so we currently have uh, 13 uh, rapid evidence profiles up on our website. You'll see three examples there. The first one specifically on a mental health and addiction issue, which again is uh, an interest probably of a number of you who've joined the call. And Mike will come back to this in a bit more detail later. I've just summarized here five of the lessons that I personally have learned um, from watching our model evolve. Um, over these last few months. Um, one reinforced a point that we were well aware of before, the importance of organizing a brief call with the requester of the rapid evidence profile to fully understand both the issue and the context in which a decision about the issue is going to be made. Just as important, if not more important to hear than it is for any kind of rapid evidence response. Second, and this is becoming a bit less of an issue over time, but the importance of distinguishing evidence from opinion. So in the early days of the pandemic, many so-called guidelines, even from highly reputable sources, were largely based simply on the opinion of uh, key individuals, and there was very little evidence underpinning uh, those opinions, but that is beginning to shift over time. We also have grown to realize how essential it is to drive home again and again in our rapid evidence profiles the distinction between what's known from the evidence and wh who's doing what, which comes from the jurisdictional scan of what other jurisdictions are doing. doing. Third thing that we learned was provide a date stamp literally to the exact day. Um, any time you cite an evidence document. And that date stamp is for the date the evidence search was conducted, not the date that the document may have been finalized. But if you can't find the evidence search date, at least provide the date that the document was finalized. So in a domain like COVID-19, where the science is moving very fast, a document date stamped the 1st of May is going to be given much less attention than a document that is date stamped the 30th of May. So that date stamp, um, critically important. Fourth lesson learned, provide a quality rating for any key evidence document that you cite. And better yet, if you're familiar with um, a tool like GRADE, consider grading the strength of the evidence. But perhaps because of the many new entrants into this evidence synthesis field related to COVID-19, perhaps because of the rapidity with which people were moving, um, the early flood of rapid reviews about COVID-19 were often of very low quality in terms of how systematic and transparent they were uh, in the application of methods. So those quality ratings are key. 
And then finally, and this is very relevant, again, if you were part of that mental health and addictions call in Canada, think about getting a product up as soon as possible and then explore whether and how to further develop it and think about making it a living review, even if that wasn't your original intent. So Mike will come back with some more lessons learned, but those are some uh, that jump out at me. Insight six, and I'm almost done. I'll turn it over to Mike in just a few minutes. Tips and tools for those supporting decision makers. This has been part of the COVID and website from the beginning. Two of the tips are about making sure you have the right team and relationships in place. So making sure you that you have those connections both on the evidence demand side and the evidence supply side. Six of the tips focus on creating the right processes to respond to requests from decision makers. So our team, the moment the request comes in, divides up the different sources laid out in the guide. Uh, each person goes to whatever sources they've been allocated. Uh, they are looking for those quality rated products. And if they're not already quality rated, but it's an important document, we rate the quality quickly. And we have done as many as 10, 15 quality ratings within a very, very short window of time. And as I mentioned before, document the recency of the search. And then finally, two of the tips relate to the right balance between being reactive and proactive. The last few months have been dominated by a reactive mode, but we're increasingly realizing how important it is to be proactive in getting out there with living systematic reviews on topics that either are starting to become important or almost certainly will. So now I've come to Insight 7, which was the one that I had bolded in the overview um, of the webinar because this is our newest edition and it's a comprehensive listing of resources for researchers who are uh, starting to produce evidence syntheses related to COVID-19 topics. This was developed by a working group co-chaired by David Tovey, who was the editor-in-chief of the Cochrane Library from 2009 to 2019, and our colleague Karen Young from Stellenbosch University, who runs the Center for Evidence-Based Healthcare, two eminent scientists in their field. And what they and their working group have done is create an interactive flow diagram that allows you to see the steps that you might want to go through as when you're asked to produce or when you undertake to produce a new evidence synthesis. And that can then also be used to move around within the diagram and access different content. And then you'll see the additional content here. So if you go to the COVIDN website, all of these are clickable parts of the menu, how to clarify the issue or the decision, avoid duplication of effort, um, update an out-of-date review, or if you're conducting a new review, what are all of the resources that will help you do this in the COVID-19 space most efficiently? So there are a large number of COVID-19 specific resources, and our advice is stand on the shoulders of those who have developed those resources um, and also make sure that you make use of um, existing resources that may not be specific to COVID-19, but are essential to preparing a high quality evidence synthesis. The final slide that I have is about the covid and community. So we have, as I mentioned before, a set of covid and partners. We have a set of covid and working groups. And with the leadership of our engaging working group, which is co-chaired by Maureen Dobbins from McMaster University, Lawrence Langer from the Africa Center for Evidence, we're about to launch a COVID end community. So we have begun reaching out to 20 plus networks around the globe um, of groups that are involved in preparing evidence syntheses or responding to decision makers' questions uh, and inviting them to join the listserv. So we'll be uh, making available information about how to join that listserv uh, very shortly on our website. So those are um, eight insights from my side, and I'll turn it over with that uh, to Mike, who's now going to elaborate on one of the pieces that I talked about, uh, the evidence support model. So Mike, over to you. All right, thank you, John. Um, so thanks everyone for joining and thanks for the uh, great insights and overview of the, so far, John. Um, so just in case everyone hears background noise, my youngest three-year-old just chose now to have a huge tantrum in the background. So if you hear that, my apologies. Um, I want to share with you some very on-the-ground steps involved in the evidence support that John uh, talked about. 
Um, and a couple things just to frame what a, a, some of these insights. The first is that this has been very much a learning process and I feel like we incorporate something new or different or refined in each of the different rapid evidence profiles that we do. And so what I'm presenting now is going to be a snapshot of kind of where we're at now with our learning and our processes and how we approach this. And then the second is that this is informed now from many years of conducting rapid syntheses, just not this rapid. So we, we had done rapid syntheses in 3, 10, 30, 60, or 90 business days, and we had experimented lots in the past with kind of extending timelines to, 30, to 60 and 90 and doing much more in-depth reviews. But in this sense, we've had to do the go the other way and figure out how we can respond to questions where we need very where there's a very urgent need for evidence so often within three to four hours so that's the context for the evidence support that we've been providing um, and so the first part that we've had to learn is you know, logistics and really how to do this in a really efficient way while also ensuring we're being systematic and transparent in our approach so we after the first couple of rapid evidence profiles we really decided that we had to turn to online project management to coordinate everyone in real time and so we're using ms teams to allow us some rapid communication between team members um including alerting to new requests and the need to convene a, a meeting where needed sometimes just quick team huddles um we have a, 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 a large number of team members. So we, we have a partner liaison, which is usually John, who's working with the requesters on a table that he sits on locally here in Ontario and in Canada, who is working with policymakers to identify evidence. We also, for each rapid evidence profile, have a coordinator. So someone who is kind of in charge of coordinating the whole team, but also assembling the rapid evidence profile at the end. It, it, it's important for things like version control and just having one pair of eyes looking over it all the time to ensure consistency. So that's usually me or a colleague, Carrie Waddell, who's doing that, and increasingly also Heather and, uh, and others at the forum. Uh, and then we have anywhere between five and 10 team members working on a rapid evidence profile at any given time. This allows us to do a large amount of work in a relatively short period of time. Um, I'm just figuring out how to change the slide. There should be a button on the left, Mike. I can do it for you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there I got it. Thanks, John. Um, so when we get into planning the work, we uh, similar to what John mentioned for his insights to their doing this in liaising with the partner and clarifying the question, we find that also really important internally to do, to make sure that everyone understands the question and the scope and knows the timeline. Then also to work through as a team the countries that we should include in the jurisdictional scan. and we. We do this by trying to identify countries that are typically further ahead in addressing the pandemic and or that offer unique insights into the topics being addressed. And in addition, we typically, if not already included, we look to the typical comparators to Canada. So countries like the UK, Australia, New Zealand, so the, the kinds of countries that Canada often gets compared to. Um, and then in the, I would say this is, Perhaps one of the more important points that we use now in the rapid evidence profiles is we develop a framework to organize the evidence documents and the insights from the jurisdictional scan to help one anchor the review, but then just organize the results by relevance and the different components of the question. So I'll give you an example of that in a second, one that was done. And then, as John mentioned in one of his slides, then we, we assign resources to search to each team member. So all those sources on our evidence guide for decision makers, the key sources, we we uh, assign the five to 10 team members to look at different parts of that and then report back to us. So in terms of the organizing framework, here's one example on this slide. It was about a, a rapid evidence profile we did about testing, specifically insights about evidence and, and scans that can inform who should be tested for COVID-19 and how frequently, where, by whom, and what follow-up actions. So we organized all of our findings using the bullets below as a taxonomy that, that we use to uh anchor the review so who should be tested how frequently where what part of the health system should be leading at what is the basis for the decisions um what approaches could be used that to directly complement testing and then what part of the health system should lead the approaches that directly complement the testing um and then for those of you who are on the call as well who are joining from the mental health grant that we've been working from Another recent example that we just completed last week that I didn't put on the slide just because the taxonomy was too large 
was a question that we did about what pandemic related mental health and addictions issues have emerged and what indicators and strategies can be used to monitor and address them respectively. So for that question, we organized it <clears throat> in relation to three sub questions. The first was about have health system and economic social responses to the pandemic affected the type and prevalence of those mental health and addiction issues that are likely to require a response. Um, and within that, we said it could be you know, overall or it could be specifically as a result of health system arrangements being altered, such as discontinued uh, or reduced services or adjustments to care delivery that may have created some barriers to access or participation. And then it could also, we also know it could be specifically where economic and social responses may have happened. So, and in a variety of sectors, children, youth services, community social services, et cetera. Um, and then the second sub question was what indicators could be used for monitoring pandemic related mental health and addictions issues? And then lastly, what strategies are being used to address pandemic related mental health and addiction issues? And we sub categorize that by health system arrangements and then how uh, economic and social responses might need to be modified. So there's another example of how we've done, of how we've used a, a, a framework to anchor our, our reviews. So once we finally get started through that quick, after that quick team huddle, develop a, an organizing framework, uh, me or whoever is coordinating it will send a, the, the framework with the templates for tables and the taxonomy and the search assignments, and then team members will spend anywhere between one to two hours conducting searches of their assigned sources. If we have a longer timeline, such as three days, uh, we can take longer, uh, especially if the, the topic is a bit more complex. Uh, and then we, the relevant documents that we find from each of those sources, we organize them by document types. So those types that John mentioned earlier from guidelines that are developed using robust processes, full systematic reviews, rapid reviews, guidelines with some sort of evidence synthesis or expert opinion, uh, protocols, titles, single studies, et cetera. <clears throat> and then we assign the categories, categories from the organizing framework so that we can easily analyze or organize results later according to that framework in a roll-up table um, that we present as kind of the, the summary of key messages later on. And then we also assess them as high, medium, or low relevance to the question using a color gradient, so dark to light blue, and I've got a screenshot of that later for you. Um, and then it's usually done by the person who is looking for the sources in, in their set of search results, but if there's a kind of a question about relevance, people who use MS Teams to ask a question and get another set of eyes on it, and then the coordinator, and then uh, finally the liaison, so John would have another set of eyes on relevance assessments as well, so it goes through many stages. And then each document is then presented with a hyperlinked declarative title that provides insight into the main findings. So initially we were just hyping, hyperlinking titles, but eventually we, we said, you know, it's a little bit of extra work but it provides a big payoff to at least be able to provide additional insights about what the review or a single study found in relation to the question being asked. And then if uh, whoever's looking at it wants more information, they can easily click on the title. So here's an example of an appendix with documents that we've found that are organized by our, uh, the relevance to the question in the blue column and the sub-bullets within it. This is for the testing one that we did. Um, and then the declarative titles under the focus uh, with the producer who, uh, who put out the guidance in brackets afterwards. Uh, and then when we pull it all together and all team members send their findings to the coordinator or coordinators, if it's both of us working on it, and then any full systematic reviews and rapid reviews that are identified as highly relevant are also appraised for methodological quality using ANSTAR, and those are included in the final uh, rapid evidence profile. And then all the included documents and lessons learned from the jurisdictional scan are at the last stage integrated into table templates that were developed during the planning stage and using the organizing framework. And we use that to provide an overview of key findings about the topic that highlights the number of focus and key findings from highly relevant documents. So at a minimum, it's a bulleted list with the number of each type of document, but then usually table one is then a table organized using that framework uh, that we use with the relevant, with the most highly relevant evidence, do evidence documents and the big picture insights from the jurisdiction scan. Then it's sent to, uh, lastly, the partnership, the partner liaison for final review. So here's an example of one of those rolled up tables before I turn it over to Heather, um, where we have, the, this is just the first row in it, where we asked who should be tested for the virus and whether it's symptomatic, asymptomatic, 
and here you can get a snapshot into that we divided this further by virus testing and antibody testing and the highly relevant evidence documents um, with their declarative headings and the uh, sources for those guidelines, but then also experiences from other countries are rolled up into the same table. So our hope in this table is that it, can, it gives the policymakers or others who have eyes on this a quick glimpse into one, what the most highly relevant documents are, and then two, the key insights from them that they need to know uh, in moving forward. So I think that's my last slide, and I can turn it over to Heather. Thank you, Mike. Um, you know, sometimes when, the, when, it, when I was first introduced to the process of the rapid evidence profile, um, it was amazing to me. Like, it almost takes you as long to, to understand the process as it does for the team to do one. It's quite amazing um, that all of those steps that Mike just listed are, are completed sometimes in as little as three hours. Um, so it's exciting. I think the trade-off, and Mike would know more about this, uh, than me, but to point out, as he said, this is more about surfacing what's relevant. It's less about kind of connecting the evidence um, to uh, what it's telling you. Um, so it's, 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 it's taking you less down the road of um, decision making than some processes that uh, are a little bit longer and allow you to think about uh, synthesis and integrating findings differently and what, what, the, what the meaning of them is. So that I would say is the big difference, but in the context of the pandemic, it, it has been really important and really well received so far by uh, stakeholders. So I'm going to switch gears now and, and just end with our last insight to tell you about what's on our, our own horizon. Um, and that is, uh, we are intending very, very quickly to embark on a horizon scanning process. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a structured process that um, is used to identify, assess, and prioritize innovations um, that could influence policy, service delivery, and practice. This is kind of the general um, uh, horizon scanning process. And it, the idea is that it helps us, uh, from a more systematic or structured process, allow you to identify what might be important in the future. And so instead of being purely reactive, it allows you to start being more proactive. And so um, we've been discussing with the COVID and partners, uh, you know, how as an evidence synthesis guidance and HTA community, we can go from the really important reactive requests for synthesis that have been um, posed to us collectively um, to uh, a place where we can start to shift the balance and identify emergent issues related to the pandemic um, that could likely benefit uh, or be prioritized for evidence synthesis and guidance development in the, in the future. Um, and, you know, part of, part of what's interesting in working in this global community is, is you do have a sense that the pandemic um, is progressing differently, different issues are arising in, in uh, different global contexts. And so, in some ways, um, I think the horizon scanning process will be helpful, or we're ho hoping it will be helpful to start to surface some of the needs that are being prioritized related to COVID-19 from the global south and other LMIC contexts. So that's sort of a side benefit that we're hoping that this does. Um, because as we know, um, just with the progress of the pandemic starting in, in, in Asia and then largely now being in kind of Western Europe and, and uh, North America, now only more recently hitting the global south. Um, uh, it, the contexts are quite different there and the needs for potential responses or the way um, that, that evidence might play into those responses could look different. So uh, just wanted to give everyone a heads up that that is coming uh, soon, hopefully. Um, and you know, we're hoping to use this process in two ways. One to help us um, to improve our own efforts. So for example, by um, uh, you know, adjusting and refining the taxonomy that John spoke to. And then also as a source of information for uh, COVID and partners so that they again can work with their decision-making communities um, to sort out whether they might want to start to embark on some evidence synthesis activities that aren't just about the question that came up yesterday at the command table, but might be about a question that will probably come up in a few weeks or a few months time. Um, you know, and if you think about some of the key uh, uh, challenges with respect to uh, the pandemic, 
I think about in, in Canada, you know, we, we've probably had some opportunities to feed in evidence um, and make a difference in terms of some of the decisions that could have it could have resulted in different outcomes. So if you think of the long-term care crisis in Canada and some of the other countries, um, or even you know the the lack of patient, family, and caregiver engagement in um, pandemic decision policy decision making, um, it, you know, would could we have shifted the conversation slightly? Could we have seen that coming differently than we did? Apologies, there's my phone. Um, and so that is a question to be answered. And we hope that the horizon scanning process will allow us to do that. Sorry, I just put myself on mute. Well, I turned off my, my home phone. Um, and so uh, with that, uh, I think I'll turn to my kind of thinking about how these insights can support COVID-19 mental health and substance use syntheses um, funded by CIHR. So part of the reason for offering this webinar today was because we said in, in our proposal for our own um, uh, rapid synthesis service uh, that we would offer uh, to share some of the insights we've learned by doing this, kind of not specifically within mental health, but more generally related to COVID-19. And so just as somebody who has expertise in mental health and substance use or addiction, um, you know, my sense of participating in these processes, both COVID and internationally, having um, some experience now with the rapid evidence profiles and, and the work that's underway there, is that the evidence sources that John referred to in the guide, um, they often do have mental health and substance use specific evidence. It's, it is worth searching them. Um, you don't have to go to kind of mental health specific places um, related to COVID-19. There seems to be more and more, if you think about the epi mapper and some of the other sources there, um, there is really often either things are tagged as mental health or they're very easily searchable um, related to that. So it's worth going and checking out those sources. A second uh, reflection that I have is the taxonomy of decisions that John referred to in those four different areas um, include a lot of mental health and substance use specific decisions that are already articulated in that taxonomy. And we continue to refine that taxonomy and build it out. And as I mentioned, I'm hoping that the horizon scanning process will contribute to that as well. So um, again, this is inclusive of not just the specific clinical and public health needs arising from COVID-19 specifically, but the taxonomy addresses and focuses equally on uh, where we also expect to see impacts of the pandemic and, and mental health and substance use areas are, are two of the key ones. Um, and what's nice about the taxonomy is it also uh, reflects the economic and social responses. And we know many of those are determinants of mental health. And I've just listed a few there that you can find in that kind of fourth category. So it is really inclusive and helpful um, it, it helps me, uh, for my own thinking, uh, make sure I'm not missing any way to uh, any particular element that might be important specific to mental health. So uh, in my other work, I'm involved very much in kind of the, you know, what does the PPE situation look like in the community mental health and addictions field in Ontario as an example. And how do we help people who are experiencing severe and persistent mental illness adhere to public health measures. So those are two that would come under that public health taxonomy domain, but there are many others that uh, go across all of the different um, taxonomy domains. <clears throat> and then finally, um, you know, we're, we're, we are trying to use this innovative model, this rapid evidence profile service to answer questions that are coming specifically from Ontario's Mental Health and Addiction Center of Excellence, um, which is part of the Ontario Health in, in the Government of Ontario. And we're using a key group of stakeholders that meet weekly um, at the COVID response table to help us identify key pressing, pressing questions that they have for their own decision making and feeding in. So uh, I can share hopefully over time some more reflections of how that's going and how they're finding the products useful. As Mike mentioned, we've developed the first one and there is a link in the slide um, and this, this presentation will be, is recorded and will be available afterward. Um, just to let you know. So with that, uh, we can conclude this portion. We've saved 15 minutes for questions and conversation. 
Uh, we've listed the website Twitter. Uh, the community listserv is hopefully going to be here in the next week or two. And uh, email uh, if you have if you want to contact us and learn more. Or if there's opportunities for collaboration, we'd love to hear it. So with that, uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, uh, please uh, enter them into the chat box, and Steve can help us work through them. Steve, do we have any questions to start with? Uh, thanks, Heather. Well, just to echo what you just said, if anybody has any questions, please use the chat box and we'll uh, work through addressing them. Uh, we have one comment and question. Uh, so they said, thank you for the valuable work that you have done. Uh, and then they asked if there's a mechanism that you consider for evaluating or measuring the impact or effect of COVID end. Well, that is a fantastic question. I'll start and then John, please, uh, please, please add on. Uh, some of the work that I, I actually just before this webinar, I was working through a refinement of a logic model that we've collectively developed um, uh, for COVID end. And we're in the process in one of the working groups uh, trying to design um, a study to, to allow us to understand, um, because COVID end is a network, how organizations who are part of COVID end have pivoted and shifted uh, their activities to support the COVID response. Um, and also uh, to understand and track how relationships are changing over time. So we've, we've kind of got two elements specifically that I'm involved with where we're looking at understanding um, COVID end as a network uh, and the organizations within it um, and trying to do some of that foundational work now. John, did you want to add anything? I'm just uh, putting a summary in the chat box, Heather. So, um, yeah, so I think it's what you said. I'm just giving a little bit more detail for folks that want to know more. Did you Great. hear me? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so we have another question um, about uh, what the role is of preprint servers in this kind of service. They are very rapid evidence sources, but they are not peer reviewed. I can jump in if you want. So it's a good question. Uh, and we grappled with that on one of the early rapid evidence profiles that we did. So in the one of the columns in the appendix table that we have with all the declarative titles, we always put the date that it was published. And in that case, we put posted on the date and then in brackets preprint so that it's very transparent which are and which are not uh, peer reviewed yet. But we, we feel as though it's important to at least include it given how fast the findings are coming out that give that flag um, that it's not peer reviewed yet. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, we have another comment and question. Uh, great presentation. Do you have a list of databases and gray list sources that you search for your reviews? And have you found some sources not worthwhile to search? So this is John. I'll just copy and paste into the, um, the chat box the particular link to the, the guide to key COVID-19 evidence sources. So that is uh, what we uh, prioritize for searching. And sorry, it could be that my last post went to just the panelists. So Mike and Heather, if that didn't go to all attendees, my last one, uh, would you mind bouncing it? This yeah, last uh, link, if you click on the uh, URL that I put in the chat box, um, you'll see the guide. Um, so these are what we consider to be the kind of high yield, high quality sources. So um, if you're if you're a group that maintains a COVID-19 evidence hub somewhere and it, you're not here, uh, there's two possibilities. One is somehow we might have missed that needle in a haystack. And so please feel free to send us uh, suggestions. The other possibility is that while the site might be helpful, it feels to us like it has been superseded by some of these other sites. So uh, this guide lists only those sites that we have prioritized um, because of their high value to our searches. Once you get beyond this list, the returns to additional searches um, in our experience are extremely, extremely low. Um, so we, in our uh, other document, however, the um, the got the resources for researchers, we put in all of the preprint services, all of those other uh, sites in a lot more detail so that if you were doing a full systematic review and had many months to do the work, 
um, those additional sources are listed in that longer document, but uh, these are the ones in the guide uh, for which I sent the URL that we consider to be the high yield sources. I just copied and pasted John's uh, comment on the uh, logic model and sustaining working group um, activities around understanding COVID and itself. Uh, I think there's a hopeful, uh, there's hope that, you know, the silver, one of the, the potential silver linings of this pandemic could be an opportunity for the evidence synthesis community to be a little bit more coordinated um, and reduce unnecessary duplication uh, and, and have just a better collaborative working relationship moving forward. And, and so that is, I think, an opportunity that could come out of the crisis that we're interested in understanding if COVID and contributes to or not. Yeah, so I've just brought us back. Thanks, Heather. I've just brought us back to that <clears throat> background slide where, you know, the good news is the explosion of interest in and demand for evidence synthesis. So that is fantastic. Um, and what COVID end is trying to do in part is to try to channel that interest and make the best of the opportunities on the in terms of the uh, demand side by reducing that noise to signal ratio. So I mentioned how heartbroken we were when we did the work on face masks to see how many groups around the world within a one week period had answered the exact same question um, for decision makers in their context. And if you work through the resources for researchers that we've newly uploaded on the site, um, their interactive flow diagram um, starts off by saying, you know, be clear about the question, but then look to see whether somebody has already done this and whether they actually have a response that you can simply contextualize to your context or whether it simply needs updating. And then only if those two uh, conditions aren't met, would you want to undertake a new review because there is so much um, out there already. And then as Heather was saying, uh, we're very interested in learning about how COVID and better positions its partners, but as we grow the COVID and community, um, how, uh, whether we're able to shift the evidence ecosystem in ways that make it more robust and resilient in the future. Uh, and we're always focused on trying to strengthen existing institutions and processes. So COVID end as a network will go out of existence over time. Uh, but what we'd love to feel is that we've had some impact um, in terms of strengthening the fantastic groups that are already out there, both in terms of how they respond to COVID-19, but how they also how they respond to other challenges in future. Thanks, John. Uh, I don't see any other questions coming into the chat box right now, but uh, if anybody does have any last questions, please uh, take the time to enter them now. Um, for those of you who haven't already, I would just like to encourage you to visit the COVID End website, uh, as well as to follow COVID End on Twitter as well, just to stay up to date with uh, all the updates from not only COVID End, but uh, COVID End partners as well. Um, but uh, just while we're waiting to see if there's any last questions, Mike, did you have anything else that you'd like to, to share? Uh, no, nothing from me, Steve. Okay. Uh, Heather, did you have anything else? No, thank you everybody for spending uh, the hour with us. Great. And John? Did you have any last uh, comments? Or? Just to you know, warmly welcome people's thoughts um, you know, about how COVID and can better support you. And that, that could in include by giving us you know, insights about how to adjust the guide, how to adjust the resources for researchers, um, how to improve the taxonomies. And we have a number of uh, priority projects coming up that we're going to be working on. Heather mentioned the, the horizon scanning. Uh, we also mentioned the COVID and community listserv, um, but there's some others like trying to encourage the, um, uh, the uh, creation and maintenance of living reviews across the entire spectrum of decisions that are going to need to be made. And we've been really heartened by how in the last few weeks we're starting to see more and more living reviews. So on the evidence synthesis that Heather and Mike and Carrie led, 
uh, related to mental health and addictions, the, the great silver lining of that document for me was finding a living review um, about some of the very issues we were being asked to address. So if we got another call three weeks from now or or so we would know now to immediately go to that living review because those uh, researchers are um, always updating their living review based on the best science. So my hope for the future is that we have an array of living reviews out there that give us good coverage across the taxonomy with minimal uh, duplication. And hopefully when duplication exists, it's it's a considered duplication. People recognize the existence of the other review, but feel that there's complements it in a powerful way. I think the, the disheartening thing up until now has just been duplication of effort because people haven't known what else is happening out there. But hopefully with the COVID and website, it's less and less likely that you would um, suddenly find yourself um, taking on a new project without uh, knowing already that there was already a review, already a guideline, already a registered protocol, and so on. And I posted the link to that living review in the chat earlier. If anybody wants to scroll back up, you'll see it. Great. Well, thanks very much again to uh, John, Heather, and Mike for sharing your insights today. Uh, I think uh, we don't have any more questions and are pretty much out of time. So uh, and thanks everybody for joining us here. Uh, as I mentioned before, please uh, go ahead and check out the COVID end website uh, after this webinar for more information. Um, there's a whole lot of resources there that you can make use of. Um, and hopefully we will uh, have you join us for one of our future top 10 webinars. Thanks again. Have a great day. Thanks everyone.